also uh, can see about my background. I'm, uh, let's say, I'm working since more than 30 years in the pharmaceutical industry. I started my career at the time with qualification and validation of uh, systems in the pharma industry were coming up. And a little bit later on, I got heavily involved in the in the field of high potent substance. This will be also the topic of today. GMP and occupational safety is focused on aseptic processing. I'm also involved in the ISO group, ISO TC198, for aseptic processing on healthcare products and also on isolators. Here you can see, so in general, I'm based from my work in Switzerland. This is my family. That's myself here. That's my two daughters. This is my wife, and there we was hiking in the northern part of the US. This is uh, Mount Rainer Vulcano, where we did a hike around this. So when we are, when I'm not traveling, which is not possible right now, and giving presentation or support companies in the field on aseptic and containment, normally like to walk around or hike with my family. So for the next hour, I have prepared the following. I would like to introduce you in the field on GMP and containment. Then I would like to go uh, more in more detail about highly potent processing, technical solutions. As Uda mentioned, I have founded the special interest group of the ISPE on the DACH as a Germany, Austria, and Switzerland on robotics. Yeah, we'll get also some information about this. And I'm also quite heavily involved in cleaning and cross-contamination. They yeah, are developed a lot of uh, guidance, how to clean isolators or how to clean areas of non-broader contact surfaces. So <clears throat> biotech industry outlet outlook and also uh, the outlook of uh, potent product in the industry. I remember many years back in a conference on ISP that was at that time in the east coast of the US. There was a presentation given from the oral dosage form because I was also involved in both oral solid dosage guides from the ISP. And there was mentioned that the oral solid dosage form will always be the majority. Yeah? All of our areas like biotech will be more a niche and the majority will always be oral solid dosage forms. Just to explain that this is not always the case, what we hear here, yeah, what the outlook is. So it was really almost 20 years back the case here, yeah, there was biotech, a really niche area. In the meantime, is the new products, the majority of the new products are biotech products. And this was the same, what was discussed at the time, the virtue of pharmaceutical companies where they said, okay, we will maybe have in 2020 only 10 different companies and the big 10 pharma companies will <coughs> supply the medicine for the whole world. <coughs> Excuse me. This is also not the case. When I look about the outlook or when I look about in specific areas like for advanced medicine of therapeutic <coughs> products, ATMPs, then we have around more than 1,000 companies globally developing medicines in that field. I mean, I look about uh, when I'm attending a conference, the name of the companies, many of those I have never heard before. And this outlook, you can also see here, when I look where the maturity is, sure, vaccinations is a hot topic right now due to COVID-19, but the major driver for the biotech industry and in general for the pharmaceutical industry are oncology products. This is the big outlook, and this was also shown on the ISP annual meeting in 2017 in San Diego. <clears throat> what type of products do we talk here about? Many years back, we have seen a trend on antibody drug conjugates. This is that part here. That is where you have a monoclonal antibody developed talking on the cancer cell and linked on it extremely potent active pharmaceutical ingredients. So this linker and cytotoxic agent may, mentioned here is normally 
chemical produced and you link this into the antibody. I will show a little bit on the next slide. There are still a lot of development going on, but faster developments are coming on regenerative medicine, which is immune cell gene therapies. There's a lot of development going on, and it seems that this development in that field got much faster than in other areas. And we have also other types with uh, different biosafety levels in uh, for biotech products, which are also considered as high potent. <clears throat> so here, a few information about the antibody drug conjugate, ADCs, what makes them so, so active and also so promising when they come to the market. You know, in general, when you look about in the past chemotherapies, then you have given a patient a chemical mixture, which they hopefully killed as much as possible the cancer cells, that there is no remainings in the body, but killed also a lot of other cells. With this antibody drug conjugate, you design an antibody with a receptor docking exactly on the cancer cell and not on other cells. So on these ADCs, there are several linkers attached, and on the end of the linker is the warhead, the payload. So, and when the ADC is getting into the cancer cells, the, the toxins, the warhead are released and should again kill the cell. There's a lot of uh, development going on because it's not so easy to design that the link is that long stable on the antibody as long as got it to the bloodstream or to the tissues until it docks to the cell and that it then release exactly then when it entered the cancer cell. So this is, but it's a specific treatment. And what is there quite interesting, this active part here, when I was always presenting on such conferences, the people from the R&D say we have the most toxic product. Yeah, this is sometimes thousand times more toxic than other products what you might see in uh, oral solid dosage forms. They are not new. These toxins or these, these uh, APIs linked to the antibody, but they were in the past the toxins that you could not give them in an oral form. And since they can link it and can make it to a specific uh, treatment and docked on the antibody, so it's more, it's better to apply it to the patient than it was possible before. So, but when we look about those, we have not only to protect the patient, so many products are not produced on a single machine. So a one machine produces often various different products. And on the equipment, you have also operators and the operator should be also protected. So, and the driver for this is in general the potency of the API. And then it's also come to a combined product like we also see in ATMPs. And, excuse me, in this sentence here, I think it's a very important part which I like to guide you to my presentation. It says here operator and patient exposure needs to be understood and controlled appropriately. Now you have to understood the toxicity of the product and you have to know the machine where you produce the product and you have to identify the risk on the equipment where material could spread in the equipment leading later on to a, pot a potential cross-contamination or where this potent substance can leave the containment or leave the isolator in the surrounding and can be exposed then to the operators. Yeah, <clears throat> that leads me also to this containment pyramid. Many years, there is in general to start a no harmonization. Yeah, we have a bending here in the pyramid from one to six. And other companies have different bandings. But as Uda said, I'm uh, chairing since many years the ISP containment group. We published in 2013, uh, the German version, 2015, the German version of the containment manual, and 2017 was followed the English version. By the way, 
the most successful document the ISP ever published. So we have sold more than 1,100 books. And this is, in general, the highest rank, one of the highest ranking the ISPE reached on, uh, on guidance or uh, on books what they uh, developed and also sold then to the members and non-members. We work not now in the second edition. And in the second edition, we already defined that we would like to harmonize this. We like to harmonize the bandings because this always leads to confusion. Everybody speaks about bandings and every and often the banding has a different meaning. Yeah, The meaning what occupational exposure limit, this is that part here, varies partly from the companies. When I developed here many years back, this containment pyramid was a first with five bandings, then with six bandings. And we say this is a, let's say, a very good structure of the OEL levels in the bandings that we said in the whole ISP expert group that we will go away from all of the different bandings in the future, we would only like to talk about the six banding. In the beginning was only this part here, occupational exposure limits. <clears throat> and six years back, we started then also to put this, this part here, which means is that the GMP part for the permitted daily exposure or acceptable daily exposure. I will explain this also on the next following slides. <clears throat> Just to let a few words for those who are, might not so be familiar with those bending and with those um, OELs. So the bendings were coming on a time where the industry has not had for every product an occupational exposure limit. And the defined bendings were coming from the pharmaceutical industry but I said on my specific banding, like for here or before, yeah, we have certain amount of hormones and this facility is designed for OEB4 products when all of our hormones can be maybe produced inside there. Because <clears throat> maybe 10 years back, there was only a, for a few uh, pharmaceutical products on OEL available. So on these OELs, these are those here. This is in general for the operators where they can be exposed of an eight hour shift, 40 hour week, their lifetime working in that area without having any effects seen from the product or from the various product produced on the facility or where the operator is working. In the beginning, as we had the pyramid, there were also mentioned potent, low potency, moderate potency, high potency. That's we, did, that's we changed into hazardous, was also around eight years back. Because we have seen, and we do not uh, speak in a way that what all of the people from the production to the engineering and designers understand in the same way then we misinterpret something because high potent yeah, can for somebody also be something different. Yeah? High potency has a, not a negative image. Yeah? High potency is also maybe Red Bull, yeah? high caffeine. And that's the people also in production and you work with a highly hazardous substance. And that's the understood, that's the understand. And then is the reason why we have changed this. So the different colors, I want to explain you also a little bit about this. The different colors is this was this gray and blue is in general what we can visibly see. We can visibly see in a nice room where the sun goes in and you see some particles around 100, 150 micrograms per meter cubic. The same we can actually also see when we talk about um, stainless steel surface. When we take a nicely polished stainless steel surface, 10 to 10 centimeters square, 100 square centimeters, we can roughly see when there is a concentration of more than 400 micrograms on the surface, then we can visibly see this, that there is still some products left. Many of those hypo of this new uh, biopharmaceutical products are in this range here, in, in the highest peak here. 
So even the six span is already maybe too rough. We have uh, products where we develop the facility design right now, which maybe many of you knows, Botox. Botox is the most toxic product right now on the market. This is a nerve toxin. And I think the OEL is around 23 picograms. So we do not talk here about nanograms here. We are left, we go already in picogram levels. Maybe to explain you here, you know, this is what you can visibly see when you go in band three, then you have to be already 10 times better what you can visibly see or on surface the same. You have to clean 10 times better than visible clean. 100 times OEB4, 1000 times better when it comes in OEB5, 10,000 times when we reach the level of 100 nanogram, and so on. Yeah. You can easily go with extremely potent substance that you have to be a million times better what you can normally visibly see. So even when the operator would be exposed to a higher concentration, not seeing it, he could be up to a thousand times overexposed and he would not realize this. So <clears throat> I have made this in the past always to explain it a little bit more in a, how the people can imagine. They say, when you take one gram, yeah, it's normally a third of a teaspoon of powder. And you have to dilute it from one gram to one microgram, going OEP5. Then you need one million meter cubic on air. And the Empire State Building has exactly one million and six, I think, cubic meters. So you need the whole volume to dilute a very small amount of powder into a concentration of one microgram. One microgram is in general the minimum what we have to reach when I look about the portfolio and biotech products. The so most of them we have to be <clears throat> much better. So the volume increased in here up to five, 10, or a hundred times of such an empire state building to get down to the concentration. What I'm also often asked is, ah, yeah, you speak about particles, yeah, concentration, how is this uh, with ISO or, ISO, uh, or a GMP, different grades in clean room, and particles there has nothing to do, yeah, in, in clean room, where we talk about ISO different classification and particle size and, and, diame uh, and, uh, and amount. Does count every particle in, uh, in high potent, or when we talk about high potent products and we talk only about the one particle which is potent and not all others. So, <clears throat> The ISPE does a lot of initiatives, yeah. And even this one, as we talk about PDA, PDEs for permitted daily exposure on the EMA guidelines, published in 2014, this is that one. The driver for this was actually uh, an ISPE document. And when I remember back a time as I started in containment, more than 20, almost 25 years back, and there was a small, we were a small group, yeah, mainly from the US, a few from Europe where we started. And actually in 2005, the FDA asked, uh, especially our group, there was one person, Edwin Melandes from the FDA, and they said, we have to get a different approach of, pharma, of manufacturing pharmaceutical products in shared facilities. And then in 2005, uh, we started uh, with the ISP containment group, the initiative about this risk map uh, guideline. So what is this one here? And this was around uh, 2007 in the first drafts also introduced to the EMA. And in the EMA, they had also in their guidelines two chapters where they were not so happy with. There was chapter 3.5 and 5.18, which was said, Certain products can be certain products like certain hormones, cytotoxic, and so on, can be produced in a shared facility or a shared equipment. But the certain, the word certain, was not so that the, that the companies, pharmaceutical companies, could say, yeah, is my product a certain hormone or is maybe other product? So there was not a clear definition on this. And then EMA set our own expert group on this, 
where I said we have to revise our documents. And in the end, they did similarity like is in the risk map baseline guide, they said you have to have for every product a permitted daily exposure based on an expert who has calculated. So in the, in the risk map, there was, we were talking about acceptable daily exposure and the EMA guideline was, we talked about uh, permitted daily exposure. The difference is only the first letter from acceptable to permitted, but uh, it is in general the same. So there is no difference. The only difference is that in 2014, this document was published. It's a period of two years. First, it should be implemented for new products and for existing products, and then for veterinary products. So and since end of 2016, is it in Europe mandatory? So it's a European guideline. But in 2018, it was adapted from the PICS as a guidance document. So as the PICS adapted this as a guidance document, it is in general for all 52 members, I think and India is also in PICS, a guidance document when the inspector comes and visit your company. So this is now mandatory. ISP guidelines are a strong recommendation, but there is no force using an ISP guideline, but a GMP guidance, which is then also part of the EU GMP guideline or a, of the PICS um, uh, documents they use for inspection, then it's better to follow those documents. So what does it, why it was coming, I've already mentioned this, there was not a clear definition about certain products, yeah, which one, and they also said cleaning parameters, yeah, 10 ppm or a 1000 therapeutic dose. And so this is also coming from a period of time where we do have not spoken about the high potent products. We have to define for cleaning the same, yeah, that we say not longer on the 10 ppm or a 1000 of the lowest therapeutic dose. The company should also clean according to the permitted daily exposure. So and there is now clear defined in this um, guideline, yeah, EMA repeats and said in the meantime, everybody in the world, which are PIC members are focused on this guideline. As mentioned, dedicated facilities are required to manufacture when a medical product presents a risk because the risk cannot be adequately controlled by operational or technical measures. That means when you, the more open you handle your product, the more you contaminate your room and your operators, even when the operators are protected to respiratory protections, they pose a risk in other areas because they leave the area. So they require more and more closed system where you enclose the hazardous substance and avoid that it spread to other areas. We'll explain a little bit later on on this. So you better your primary containment, the less questions you can get on the secondary containment. You go also in dedicated when you have no talk starters, when you have not any evaluation of the product, even in early, in early stage, even when you only calculate it based on experience, maybe from uh, other product similarities, what you have already developed or which, which you can find in literatures, you also get in dedicated, but in general, exceptions are dedicated or still the same for highly sensitizing material as you cannot define a PDE for them or for assets by telatons. And the third point is relevant residues limits for cannot be evaluated satisfactorily and it is a validated analytical method. So this is for instance, also quite important, so when you cannot clean in a certain way your surfaces to demonstrate the risk of cross-contamination from the previous to the next product, then you go also and dedicate. And Botox is, for instance, such a kind of product with such a low uh, OAL or a PDE, what it has, so there is right now not really a detection limit possible, and that's the reason why the most of this product, almost all of those products run on. Uh, dedicated or in dedicated facilities. So this a little bit um, the background on the on the containment. 
So now the next part is I'd like to show you a little bit. I can only go briefly to it, not too much in detail. But I have put uh, the important parts to consider in such a kind of Olympic rings. Yeah. I thought this year we have the Olympic ring, uh, the Olympic Games, but now they are postponed. And they are designed so the, the Olympic rings because high potent aseptic is really uh, you need to have a lot of knowledge to perform this well, to fulfill really everything on sterility, on cleaning, cross-contamination, operator, operator protection, to uh, be safe, uh, GMP compliance, and also for occupational safety. So there is the one part where I am always very interested, and this is the, the, the area where I say aseptic equipment design. Maybe short information as I started uh, as a, a mechanical engineer. Yeah, I worked the first years after I finished my uh, my university on the, as a designer and were many years working in the European EH group, European Hygienic Engineering Design Group. And before I went into the pharma industry, or I worked before for a company where we delivered equipment in pharma and also in high quality food mainly in instant food, baby food. <clears throat> and when you deliver something in instant for, for infants yeah, or for baby food, then you know what hygienic design means. Because there is everything driven, but there is no dead eggs. There is everything easy to, to clean. And everything above open product is in, in the food or in the baby food infant area always considered as broader contact support. Yeah, it's not the same in aseptic or in the format. They are, they are much they are get much more in detail as as I would say in many areas of pharma. But this is the basics yeah when you have not an equipment designed hygienically then you can also not clean it appropriately. Yeah? And cleaning when you Look on the Annex 1 for aseptic processing. There will give another webinar on the 11th of July. So when you are interested in this, there will go more in that point. So there is also mentioned cleaning should be in the future for aseptic processing, even for non work parts, validated to demonstrate that you have no contamination from any remaining second be particulate or a microbial. So sterility is also an important part. So all of this equipment design, clean, helps you for the field on cross-contamination. Sterility is another part where you say, this is uh, your atmosphere inside have to be a sterile, that you have to be accepted that you can feel sterile your product. So then there's automation digitalization. I'm also since he was involved in the new update of the Annex 1 in the commenting team, there's also mention in principles, yeah, you should look more automation. People, humans should not have access to critical aseptic or a sterile operation. And for end, yeah, you have to clean and also protect your people as a clean environment, health and safety. So I made it a little bit differently for you. So in this presentation, so these rings with the colors, you will in general always see here on the side. Here on the side, I have to, which um, rings also, uh, also are needed for, for that area. So equipment design, cleaning, gross contamination, clean environment, health and safety. So when we talk about high potent processing, even when it's aseptic, in general, the high potent products before sterile filtration is normally non sterile. It's uh, so an API delivered and get then conjugated and purified and um, <clears throat> purification and is then often freezed before it goes then into the final field finish part. So here the same you have in general <clears throat> for API, the most used technology are general isolators. So isolators are those uh, uh, technology where you can put your API in, inside in different ways. Yeah, you can use air locks, you can use rapid transfer ports, as you can see here. You can use back in, back out system transferring material in, 
for the endless line assisting material transfer out and here maybe split butterfly by getting inside of such an uh, conjugation vessel. So all of those con uh, containment uh, systems you can find in the containment manual. When there is someone interested, get, I can get to you in the end is the information where you can get uh, the containment manual. And there is everything in detail mentioned of those transfer systems. <clears throat> what I would like to tell you a little bit in general, when the isolator is very well designed, yeah. I have also seen a lot of extremely poor designed isolators. This is also what the regulatories like the FDA more and more highlight that they see a lot of design failures done. Yeah. What I often face here, what companies doing wrong is gloves, connecting of gloves on the glass. You know, there are so many vari variabilities doing this. And in general, the powders get always in areas where you normally do not reach with the cleaning liquid. And there we have often remainings on the glove O-rings as the glove are not well protected. And then when the sealing is not well done, you can have exposure here. Or the glass to the, to the frame is not appropriately designed. Or the filters used are not appropriately designed for the high containment. Uh, all of those are critical items. And inside, I always say, keep as less as equipment inside and what you have inside an isolator should be hygienically designed. Here and that application for normally non-aseptic bulk material transfer, you run the isolator in negative pressure so that we have not to perform any sterility and we normally can suck the air when something happens from outside to the inside. I said equipment design, cleaning, cross-contamination is there quite important. So after we have a conjugate and we have frozen the broad, uh, when we talk about these ADCs, for instance, so then we thaw them and then we make sterile filtration and we go then into the fill and finish part. So there we have a little bit more on those dots here or rings, so equipment design. I will explain a little bit more on this because there it becomes really a very important part, not only for cleaning, also for sterility, what I have mentioned to you before. So we have the clean and gross contamination part, sterility, and also we have to protect the operators. So for what do we normally need? So even when we, when we cannot do the bioreduction filters or the sterile filters inside of the isolator, yeah, it depends on the design and also on the, on the size of the isolator, then people, when they work with high potent substance, they put this also in an, let's say, in a containment because you can. It's normally they are safe during operation, but there could also maybe some uh, leakage when you disassemble those. Yeah, you do not reuse them; you have to replace them after when you have uh, after a while or when you change the, the batch of the product. Then you, and then with the replacement, there could always be some spillage. Yeah? When you have spillage, you can always contaminate the product. And the spillage is also something you should keep in mind. Toxicity does not only mean when it's in powder form. Yeah? It doesn't matter in which form it is. Even when it's in liquid form, you have potent substance, the toxicity is still there. The concentration might change because it's diluted in liquid but the toxicity of the pure substance is the same. But the sterile connectors, this is important how they are designed, that they do not pose a risk when you disconnect it on high potency. And here, when you look on such a small filling line, again, you have normally here the vial washing system, deep irrigation tunnel, and additional airlock for getting material in. <coughs> what you may be used for microbiological monitoring, for instance. There is the filling line for the filling and stoppering. There's the liabilization part. There is the crimping. And then what's not seen here is the vial outside washing equipment. So equipment design. <clears throat> you know, this is that what, I, what I'm facing often the most failures company makes globally. You know, when you look in the new Annex 1, when they say 
sterile manufacturing. As I said, I will give them more in detail in an in around an, in, in July for my second webinar. There's one point mentioned in such first air. <clears throat> the first air should not disturb here, getting close to the open containers. <clears throat> like this is shown here with the vials. So what I often see, not here, this is really hygienically designed equipment, yeah, where you can easily remove everything, where you have no, here normally runs the vials, where you have everything designed, there's no screw, there is no openings, there's no gaps, yeah, where microorganism could settle down and could pose a risk to the product or a very high potent product. So in general, normally, when I'm working on project or with company, when there is something developed new, we always go first to the hygienic design that it fulfills the GMP requirements. And when you look about the new Annex 1, this first air is many times mentioned there and exactly means you should not disturb any airflow, unidirectional airflow which is coming from the HEPA filters to the critical working area. <clears throat> what I often see, I made here this picture here, and this is something you know, this you learn in so instant of baby food. Is not really close profiles, yeah. Where you have some areas gap between where you do not really visibly see inside, where you can have microorganism, but you cannot appropriately clean it. And I see many areas often companies developing coming from areas where they say they want also reach in or get into this aseptic fill area where they have not really as understood what hygienic design means. And this is often not easy to see. Right? This you only know when you experience in this, how does a design should look like. But also in the Annex 1 and in the containment manual from the ISB, validation of cleaning is mentioned there and validation of cleaning can only be done with hygienic designed surfaces. Filters. This is also a part where, when somebody is interested, yeah, in my first slide and my last slide is my email address. We have uh, published also a white paper from the ISBE about filters and safety of filters, how to position them. You know, an aseptic uh, filling is the critical aseptic zone is here inside. But due to the lot of air, you recirculate the air. And normally the air is recirculated to double windows or air return ducts and then having back in, back out filters somewhere located. So for those who following warning letters from the FDA in March this year was actually for an Indian company, actually a very big Indian company, a warning letter mentioned there, they received for that reason, because the FDA inspector asked the company and said, yeah, you produce your new equipment, different high potent products on your air return ducts. They have no filter before they go into the, when they leave the critical area of your equipment. And then they received really a, a, a warning letter. You can read, you can see this when you go on the FDA website, this warning letter, what is mentioned there, because they say, hey, look, you have no filter where your air goes here. You know, this is the this is the isolator, for instance. Here inside, there the air goes down. There is the specific high potent safety filter. The air goes in, goes filters. Here are the air return ducts behind the filter. They have no filter. They said you can always have your a mixture of different high potent products. And how do you uh, take the? How do you guarantee that this does not enter back to your critical uh, zone of your process equipment? You can actually not. And so since then, they are mentioned on the FDA website on how you should uh, not make it. Yeah. So how this can, can be done, that is a 10, I think it's 12, 14 pages, paper, GMP and containment. And there you can find on table seven what is important here to avoid getting warning letters or the findings, observations from your inspection. So. And filters should also be designed that they are not pose a risk to the operator when the changes and not pose a risk on contaminating back the critical zone. This is exactly mentioned in that document. So in general, is it also an aseptic processing? Forgot to mention before. 
Here we have now positive pressure. Yeah, you have cannot run aseptic operations inside a negative pressure. So you should run the uh, positive pressure to the room at minimum of 15 Pascal. But you can also avoid spreading material which are released here, maybe through filling on aerosols, maybe breakage of vials or whatever, or unloading of freeze dryer with different uh, pressure cascades. This you will find also in this document. Or with uh, computerized flow uh, dynamics so that you say show airflow simulation that you exactly know where your airflow goes and that when particles are released, then they are moved directly to the filters where they collect them and, and keep them safe in that in the area. So I have always to look a bit on the on the, the watch because we have already uh, 45 minutes, but we're good on time. So surface decontamination. You will hear more also on the 11th of July. For, so for those who are interested, this is also something where will where you will have changes after when the annex one comes like this. So we have until um, it's not postponed to. Um, July that we have to send back the comments of the ISP on the new draft which was published this year on 20th of February. And there is something mentioned there. Yeah? Perhaps an isolator system decontamination methods should be validated and controlled within defined cycle parameters. It's only one word, yeah. And when somebody does not understand this inappropriately, in defined cycle parameters. You know, many companies say, okay, I perform sterility, I put a certain amount on hydrogen peroxide in it, I have biological indicators, I expose them over a certain period of time, I incubate them later on, and when I see, okay, there is still a survivance curve, seeing we repeat this, maybe we have the decontamination a time longer, and to valid, and then, and then we say, okay, now everything is. Uh, is tilt and then we say the uh, cycle parameter is okay. In general, is it not? Yeah. So when you study a GMP, what I did after all of this qualification validation was coming up, I did their intensive studying on, on uh, a GMP at the time. Uh, and there was, uh, when you look about this, yeah, then when you look about the guidelines, they say normally you have to you have to define a design space where your system is appropriately working. So in general, or everybody makes those uh, curve here that they say, okay, you make your leak test, you make your conditioning about temperature and humidity, you have the holding time, this is that time where you have all of the exposure of the hydrogen peroxide in the room where you show them with a six log reduction and then you make the aeration. But what means quality by design? Quality by design means when your parameters change, how does your cycle change? And this is something what many or I almost know no company who only one or two companies who perform this, that they say when they develop a, a cycle that they say under this humidity range and under this temperature range, the cycle is working properly. And then you can really talk about and validated and controlled defined cycle parameters. So as mentioned, when you like to hear more about this, it's then on the, on the 11th of July, or you can send me also an email. So this is in general, so let's say the majority of what I wanted to say you about the septic filling, where you have to look on it, but uh, just a few words about uh, sterility tests. Yeah? So when you make sterility test with high potent, your product is also potent, yeah? even a sterility test. And, uh, and sterility test will be also more important with the new Annex 1. In general, you know, you can, you do not have to perform a sterility test in an isolator. Because, but in the meantime, in the guidance is mentioned, so do it in the same circumstances as the filling line is designed. But you know, we face a lot of drug shortens globally. And I know this, I have, my mother is turning 90 in six months. And I know always what problems I have going to the pharmacy and 
this product is not deliverable, this product is not deliverable, this product is not deliverable. And in the meantime, I go over, I always have uh, medications for here for three months at home because all of this, because all of the problem is the drug shortens. So the thing, the, the challenge is, you know, you can perform your aesthetic process simulation, your, uh, and, and all of the tests, what you do, in, for keep your uh, system sterile, but when you have a um, false positive on sterility test, you cannot reach, release your batch. Yeah? And for that reason, is it also that your sterility system should perform, test system should perform well, that you can demonstrate the whole sterility was performed well of your process. Yeah? When you have here a failure, you cannot release your batch. And actually, even there, you deal with high potent substance. So the safety precautions, what I've mentioned to you before, could be also considered for the sterility test. The same for storage of your final containers until you have the inspection or final packaging. Yeah? Containers like vials can also break during packaging. Yeah? And when you break during packaging, they expose the area. And even your other containers are closed, your operators are uh, contaminated or the other containers are contaminated again. I mean, a nurse opened the package in the hospital. She think normally that the containers are clean, yeah, and not contaminated. And also the cleaning of the process parts, yeah, when you remain the process parts, you have to clean them. But this I come in the end, a little bit more in detail. Robotics. So why robotics? You know, when you listen to the FDA or to European inspectors, when they go to the conference, when they speak about aseptic processing, they say we want to keep operators away from critical operations. They, they say they pose the highest risk. They also focus more that the companies, instead of using conventional, they would like for future installation only uh, barrier system, as I've shown here, isolators, because this is the most advanced technology and the operators have no direct access beside gloves. Yeah, and also that more and more uh, automation and given inside of the septic process that there is less interventions needed from the operators. So when we look about development of isolators, yeah, in general, isolators were delivered, they developed in a time to protect a septic filling line. So there was a base bed of a filling line, you put the isolator on top, and then you had the aseptic conditions around uh, the sterile operations and fillings below. Dayton was then developed such modular system that you can offer to the companies a better flexibility that they say they can change from syringes to vials to ampoules to um, whatever they like to use, yeah, because they see more smaller batches, higher flexibility, or a trend in integrated isolators. Yeah, that the isolator is part of the filling line. That not the filling line is designed together with the isolator to meet the requirements for sterility, cleaning, and cross contamination. And what's coming now more is, you know, often very complex um, operations. Like, for instance, I will show you the video or later on is. Uh, drum handling, for instance, with, with sterile APIs. Normally manually done, pose a high risk on the sterility to the open product that this is now done with robotics. So we, in the special interest groups or robotics, which I chair from the ISBE, we work right now on requirements for the future, what it means also for environmental monitoring inside of such lines and also what it means on the transfer of material in and out of those um, isolators to perform inside a safe uh, robotic operations. So monitoring, this is what I mentioned, you know, this is conventional, this is that, what normally the regulatory authorities would not like to see anymore in the future, because they say, you know, they, you have always access to critical areas, it's always be designed on the behavior or such feeling as, you know, how would you like to clean such a such a this equipment inside? Is in general impossible to clean. Yeah. So hygienic design is, as I mentioned before, 
this gets really as an important point for for monitoring and also for processing. So the less equipment you have inside, the better you can clean this. Yeah? So when you have a work in cleaning and cleaning validation, everybody would agree when I say this is not cleanable, this is cleanable. So, but robotics and automation have another important part because you can really track and trace in the future everything. Yeah, from the from F, from the material goods delivered to the finished product delivered to the hospital. So it gets more and more um, track and trace in the future. So highly potentiaseptic processing. It is not new for robotics for, for instance, a debagging of ready to use the syringes in tabs. But I want to show you an, an video for also complex uh, operation with robotics. But there you have to really design your equipment that it is fully validated on aseptic conditions that know that you have to really can really rely on the all of the operation what is automatically done inside. Even very complex lids, as you can see here, can be opened with robotics, what was not to, to perform before. So then you take the weight of the API, you dock. The transfer system and then you unload it. Yeah. What was done before with many operators and, and, and very critical to the sterile product is now done and uh, can be done in two very small isolators, which they are fully operated with robotics inside. And there's also quite important here yeah, that this powder does not spread because sterile product should only should only get in contact with sterile surface. And this is there's a lot of details in that to perform this really GMP compliance. And this is, I would say, what comes more and more and also the regulatory authorities require. So when you have your interest, yeah, you can also email me cleaning cross-contamination. But this is a, a, an, another important topic. You know, as I started uh, with high potency, there was cleaning and, and cross-contamination mainly discussed for high potent product in all solid dosage form or in API, active pharmaceutical in, ingredients reductions. Yeah. Let's say we, we, we clean product contact surfaces. But you know, in a septic processing, in general, product contact surfaces mainly in the meantime disposable. Yeah, these filling kits, what you have in an aseptic isolators, the pipes they are normally done uh, flexible in peristaltic pumps, and the needles are also disposable. But nevertheless, 95% in an aseptic isolator inside, also of a lyophilizer, are considered as non-product contact surfaces or indirect product contact surfaces. And many years back, you know, we discussed them with pharmaceutical industries and they said, yeah, we want to have an, an aseptic filling line uh, filling in place. And then I said, yeah, to what limit? And then I said, yeah, what do you mean this limit? I said, yeah, what, how do you like to clean it? Yeah, it must have defined to the potency of your product. And it was not clearly defined. Yeah. And what have we done? We started many years back defining or we were writing a paper and defined limits yeah these limits you can see here i can also give you send you those uh, papers or this is a pda parental drug association was it published at the time those papers which you can get all the detailed information so you see here the colors you see the colors here this is the pde this is that one which is in the pyramid here on the side the oel and then Defined on toxicity and experience from toxicologists, how they how they calculate um, their remainings for operator safety, and this uh, kind of calculation we used also for those tables for GMP and occupational safety. So <clears throat> here is the limits of surface with no direct product contact inside of the isolator, so micrograms per square decimeter. So limit for public, and then with uncontrolled 
with uncontrolled possibilities of unprotected hand contacts for outside of isolators in your room. Yeah, this is mainly driven by operator safety and limits of airborne inside of the isolator. In the document, you find all the rationales behind of these limits, but also limit, a visible clean means we said visible clean is for us uh, a concentration of four micrograms per square centimeter or 400 micrograms per square decimeter. And then what you have to perform the cleaning and the better the surface has to be clean for non broader contact surfaces. But have we done this? And I have there invited global experts, yeah, toxicologists, GMP experts from different major pharmaceutical companies, and also Rico Schulz is a GMP inspector, because he said this is a so important point as it was not covered so far. When you read the guidelines, yeah, and the guidelines is a fairly clearly mentioned validation of cleanliness of non broader contact surfaces has increased in popularity since the EMA proposed the following measures in order to demonstrate effect management of cross contamination risk. It's mentioned in Chapter 5.21 of Part 1 of the GMP guidelines. Depending on the contamination risk, verification of cleaning of non broader contact surfaces and monitoring of air within the manufacturing area. In order to demonstrate effectiveness from control measures against airborne contamination or the contamination by mechanical transfers. So that's we have exactly in a septic condition. We have a lot of mechanical transfers for the valves, empty valves, filled valves, whatever. We have a lot of air handling, yeah. And you have to demonstrate that this, what you how you clean, that this is suitable for the next product, yeah. And you cannot calculate based on the on your broader contact surfaces because this has defined a uh, calculation how you should clean and what the limits are is based on the batch touch what we have produced before. Here you have also let's say open valves very close to an open filling point and there is it for importance that you clean also your walking beams your equipment around to a specific level to demonstrate the cleaning effectively. Those papers in general are two papers, what we published, one for live realization, one for filling lines and isolators. They have spread it in the world. I have never seen this before. And when I go somewhere, they always say, Richard, thanks for, publi for publishing these papers. I was recently visiting a company in Germany and they said, Richard, you published with this expert group for a couple of years, this document. You know, we have 200 people in, in our QA department and 200 people in our QA department run only around with your paper. Because the other said, thanks that we have this now, because now we can, we can demonstrate to a GMP inspector the limits of the cleaning and that we are on a safe side when we produce the next product. So that just to mention, you can send me an email and then I will send you all the documents what, uh, what I have referred to. The ISP manual I cannot do, so that you have to buy from uh, uh, the ISP directly. But as I mentioned, I'm quite proud of this because this ISP document can also be found in the EDQM. The EDQM is the European Dictionary for the Quality of Medicine Products, and they normally publish also the EU Pharmacopoe. And they ordered it, they asked me, they would like to have it in the library because they think that this document they have heard from their inspectors is an important document to consider. So here you can find my email address for those who are interested, you can send it to me. And I would also like you, you know, I'm, for those of you who are in, on LinkedIn, Please send me an invitation. So when you put Richard Denk on LinkedIn, then you would normally find me. Because what I always like when I have given a presentation or conferences, which is not possible right now, that I also um, like to talk uh, uh, to put uh, the, the people I, I met into my LinkedIn account. And this time is it not possible. So please send me an invitation. I will accept it. I will not post much, but uh, often I post what is coming up from the ISP, what new guidelines are we are working on it, or what's coming up with the ISP Annex 1 or with the PIX Annex 2A, which I'm also involved in ATMPs. 
where we are on the also on the commenting team right now. So now it's one hour five minutes for the presentation. We have a little time now also if you like to ask me some questions. So thanks for listening. I hope thank you enjoyed you. it. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for an excellent presentation. And there are several questions. So we'll see how many we can answer. I'll try to put them into certain buckets. So there are a few questions which are talking of different type of isolators, specifically, you know, passive isolators versus positive pressure isolators for aseptic and potent compounds. So could you comment on that? You know, what, what is the better one and how to go about that? And um, would I, I will take my headphones out. Maybe I can hear you better. Can you repeat it again? Yeah. So this was about passive, uh, passive uh, uh, isolators versus positive pressure isolators for aseptic and potent compounds. Your your yeah. views and your opinions. What is what is recommended to be used? In general, is it when you look on the new NX1 guideline? They mentioned there that you can use also uh, negative pressurized isolators for aseptic processing when it becomes too high potent product. And I know on a on a ISP conference we did we do it once a year the ISP conference in Bethesda in in uh, Maryland uh, in uh, Maryland close to Washington D.C. together with the FDA because they are located there. And then somebody asked that. Uh, people from the FDA you mentioned this in the annex one you mentioned you can go also with high protein product in negative pressure how do you see this I say yeah we allow this this is mentioned there but you have to demonstrate me that from the outside environment you have no risk of microbiological contamination inside of the isolator and actually this is not possible to perform you know filling line isolators if they are larger or smaller one they have a certain leak rate and when you put them in negative pressure, then you, you pose the risk that you can get from outside contamination inside of your sterile product. So what we normally do when we design for a high potent facility, we say, okay, where are the critical areas? So we perform the risk assessment. We go through all of the critical steps from the filling to the capping and, and, and say, okay, because there we have a liquid form, yeah, we have aerosols, we know how they spread. We have done this with tests, with spreading and mapping studies performed. And in general, we know from the airflow that the operators also protected in low nanogram levels when their isolators are performed in positive pressure. So we go partly negative pressure when, uh, for instance, unloading the LIO. So when the LIO is unloaded, the normal stopper is pushed into the vial. It's not seen as closed because closed is a while when it's crimped but when you have an uh, 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 stopper height detection stopper gap detection before crimping where you could reject vials which the stopper has popped up again then you can also say after unloading the freeze dryer you can say you run the isolator and the crimper in negative pressure because you protect the product already with a stopper inside and you have a protection with the stopper height control before crimping. But there you have to be very careful. You have to really make a contamination control strategy of the document and the risk assessment, what measurements you have in place to demonstrate sterility because sterility we always see as the majority. It's also mentioned in this ISP document what I, when somebody has interest, you said yeah in your in the beginning the people can send me an email. As I shown here, here on the screen, they can send me an email and I can send them the document. Okay, thank you. Uh, then there is uh, there are a few questions again related to this, uh, which is you know when you look at the OEL bands, different bands like OEL band four and band five compounds. Uh, what class of positive isolator should be used? You know, what would be, you know, how would you relate the OEL band with the class of isolators, class two isolators, class three isolators? How would you select them? In general, is it, um, maybe I go a little bit up. I have here 
on my screen a little bit different that I can also see you, that uh, otherwise I cannot see you. So in general, the isolators, uh, we are the same in uh, one second. Here we are. So when we go, you said in all before and five, in general, the isolators are similar designed, yeah. When I go in a such an isolator, which you can see here, in the paraseptic, this one is one. Maybe I make it larger again that you can better see it. I can also enlarge the picture. That's no, impossible to make it appropriately. In general, the isolator design is the same. Yeah, we have we we perform normally a specific um, containment features in the isolator, like specific the filters preventing spreading into other areas. We have um, maybe the, the different pressures, which is shown. One, where is it shown? I have to have a look on here. Here, you know, we have different pressure zones where we say where is the critical area, and, the, and those we have there are also different pressure zones that we always say where the highest contamination occurs. We would not like to spread this in other areas, surrounding areas, surrounding isolator areas. And there we work a lot with such airflow simulations. We work a lot of different pressures. We work a lot on the design of the mouse holes to avoid this. Yeah? But in general, the isolators, aseptic isolators, at least from those isolators we work with or we, we make or in combination of the, of the filling lines then used, are designed always for 100% aseptic compliance on all regulations. And we put the different features on that we can fulfill. Let's say I can also tell you. The latest one we have measured was for a multi-purpose facility, a large filling line where I had 600 vials per minute to fill. It was really a big filling line. For on, a, on a west coast in California that was measured to and with all the safeties what we have implemented and so on down to a level of less than 10 nanograms per meter cubic. So in general this can be used to that level. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Uh, the other uh, series of questions are on the PDE values and generally mm -hmm. what is the tone of this question says uh, nowadays regulators you know they are asking to take the pde value directly in calculation instead of the oeb banding in cleaning validation from cross contamination mm -hmm. point of view as oeb is related to safety aspect yeah exactly this is this is exactly that reason here i come i come back to that uh, slide here again the oeb here was uh, this was coming from a time, as I said, 25 years back, as I started in the field on containment. There are no uh, PDEs or ADEs were on the market. This was the bending. This is only for occupational safety. Yeah? The bending has nothing to do with the PDE or with the ADE. I, I put it here only on the pyramid that you can see, okay, about the toxicity, the bending on the occupational level here on where is the related in general the PDE. And the PDE is in general 10 times higher than the OEL when you have 100% bioavailability. Let's say when you, you breathe normally between, depends on the size of the operator on a, a eight hour shift between let's say seven eight point five meter cubic on air and then they decided to say it's uh, 10 cubic meter is normally that what an operator breathes during an eight hour shift and when you say you have a hundred percent bioavailability then you can divide normally your pde and to 10 and then you have your oel but there's a few more considerations yeah when their pde is a you have no 100% bioavailability, then you have a little bit different calculation, and you have also calculated this is a parenteral PDA, PDE, what we normally have in a septic is always the highest uh, risk because it's always 100% availability because you inject it. 
oder if you are an oral one or if you are a dermal a PDE, there is also a difference yeah, on, on, the, on the calculation from the PDE to the OEL. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, mm. Now, this is about leak rate, you know. Uh, you know, can you say something about you know what is the accepted leak rate for high potent isolator and how do you view the whole thing? How it should be seen? How it should be qualified? Okay, in general, you know, uh, leak rate of isolators. This is the topic. Uh, then I go here back to the isolator view. Well, let's say uh, here I have it. You, in, in normally, leak rates of isolators they are performed on aseptic isolators uh, because of the decontamination with hydrogen peroxide. So you want to avoid that a too high concentration of hydrogen peroxide normally leaves the isolator. And for that reason, normally the leak rate of an isolator system is less than 10% for for hydrogen peroxide. <clears throat> when it becomes to a toxic substance, yeah, then, it's, then there is also isonorm which uh, says, yeah, when the more containment it is, you should have a leak rate of less than, uh, I have not exact in mind, less than a few percent below, and even less below 1%, which is actually not reachable, and is also not a rational behind this. You know? I'm more, as, as the, as I'm more a person who say everything is on a risk-based approach. You know, where is a leakage critical in an isolator? In general, this is something what we can also support on, on that. We say the leak rate here, when, I, when you see, you see my, my, my cursor, is it, you can see my cursor, I guess. Would I, is it is it okay, Soda? You can see yes, it? Yes, 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 you can close again the scene. Exactly. The leak rate of an isolator is, from my point of view, only in this area important. You know, this is in general the filling area, there is where we have exposure. There we have done many mapping studies, all scientifically done. We can show this to every uh, occupational hygienist and so on. So here, normally, the, the the exposure occurs. Yeah? The same of the layer onloading. This is not here above. But the highest leak rate you normally have in the upper plenum part yeah, of an isolator or on some kind of ceilings of the isolator or when you have RTPs for transferring in and out of material. There you have the highest leak rates. So for me, it doesn't matter. Yeah? If it is 10%, 5%, 3%, on all of those information mentioned from the from every guideline or the ISO norm, what I have seen, I'm also in the ISO, and as soon as we revise this document, I will change this. But in the next ISP manual, we have changed this. We have mentioned this then there because there is no rational behind. The design of the equipment, yeah, do we have the cable throughputs here? Do I have the appropriate filters? When I have filters, as I mentioned to you before the air return ducts, then I have not a critical leak rate there. So this is much better to say you perform here a risk-based approach document that is say, okay, where does your exposure is? Where does your exposure product spread? Yeah, you can do this with some mapping that we also do, that we show and demonstrate. And then you position outside of the isolator the air samplers, this um, air samplers IOM sample institute of uh, medicine, which in the in the ISP SMEPA guideline is also mentioned. And especially in that position where the highest uh, potential exposure occurs, and then you can justify that your your equipment is suitable for the potency. The, the leak rate is normally used only in, for for hydrogen peroxide to protect people during cycle uh, decontamination inside of the isolator, but has nothing to, in my point of view, nothing, there's no rationale behind for high potent substance. And as I said, we will change this as soon. The ISO norm will be revised or uh, when we have the um, ISP document updated. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, now, another question is about, again, uh, you know, the hazard and the OEB5 levels. Now, containment strategy is a function of hazard and exposure. What containment strategy is needed for OEB5 product in dilute liquid form? Are there any yes. alternatives other than isolator? <clears throat> yeah, I have. So in general, you can also use other type of uh, yeah. In a diluted form, I have also sh seen that companies using, let's say, wrap systems for high potent products. <clears throat> you know, would I or uh, to those who have sent that mention? Uh, normally, you can also use wrap system, and I know many people that say. Okay, the wrap system when there is some dilution in liquid, which is which is right, yeah. You dilute your API liquid, and normally you have three percent, five percent, maybe seven percent of API diluted in your OEL and in, in, uh, diluted in your liquid. And when 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 you are, when those persons have asked you, or several persons have asked you, when they send me their emails, I can send them this document. There is exactly mentioned in it. In general, you can say for that reason, okay, the dilution factor you have also from one to 10, maybe you have an OEL of one microgram, can be then 10 microgram for the, for the liquid form. But the challenge is here, you know, and this is exactly that what we also face here with COVID-19 with the coronavirus. You know, during aseptic filling, you have a lot of aerosols. You have aerosols creating, and the aerosols are created during the filling process. And this really depends also on the quality of the vials what you buy. When you really look in detail when you fill a vial, then you can have less aerosols created. So that means it's a bubble less filling, or that there can be a lot of bubbles in it. Yeah? It depends really on the design of the equipment of the company, whether where you buy it. And so the more bubbles you have, the more aerosols you create. The aerosols are released, and these are really in massively released. When you do this on a mapping what we have investigated on, on many different filling lines. Yeah, there's a lot of spreading of high potent substance. This is the critical one because those those spread, yeah. And those spread outside of your conventional line and those spread outside of your open wraps, for instance, because they get released to the air, they go with the high speed out of the high open wraps. They might not reach the respiratory of the operators because they stay in a higher position. They have maybe here on their uh, close to a respiratory, the IOM sampler, and then maybe they will not measure something because of the air which coming from the top and the airflow coming out from the from the wraps in the lower position. But what they, what what happened? And this is for sure. They contaminate your floor. Yeah? And the, quantum, the floor will be contaminated. The, the operators will be contaminated on the grade B uh, garments, what they were, yeah. And then comes the next step, okay, for such potent product, they say, okay, how do you transfer this material into your airlocks? How do you spread it in, outside of the, in the room? Yeah, how do you contaminate with the spreading your other equipment there? How do you transfer it? And this is exactly that what often ends up in warning letters because the regulatory authorities like inspectors, they are getting more and more familiar with that and they say, but when you have an open system, when you have spreading, how do you demonstrate that this spreading doesn't enter the room next to you where you prepare maybe the next batch for the next product here? And there you, and there you have them to start making swap analytic tests in the room and this is not easy to do. And this is in that case not easy to do. Look here, I come back here to that table. You know, the limits for public surfaces, they are extremely low, yeah, because they have a higher hazardous. And you know, limits for public surfaces have a higher, have lower levels than inside of the isolator. The reason for that this is specifically on that word here. This is an uncontrolled. You know, you don't know how you spread 
your products from uh, from different areas to different um, other areas. Okay. 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 As I said, I can we can they can send me. I can explain it. You know, you know. You I always say when I like it when I come to India. I like this always there when I'm when I have not often the chance, but sometimes I have the luck to visit companies on and advise them. And I always say, you know, the same is in other European countries in Israel. They often get more inspected than others, yeah, because you know. There's, a, there's one sentence where they say the grass always looks greener in the other garden, yeah? And the inspectors like the equipment always cleaner in the other countries, yeah? Or they like to have their, their, their inspection always more and better in other countries, maybe as they perform it in themselves. And you know, and when you do something, and it depends always on the inspector was what, how good he is in that field, does he know about all well, some inspectors, do not, they have no knowledge in hypotent, yeah, they would maybe not even ask about it. They ask maybe about computer validation as this is more the expertise. But if but inspectors get more and more exposed to this, yeah, and as it is yeah, more a fixed guideline for inspection, they have to look also on those um, potencies of product and the potential cross-contamination. I said you can use reps, but when you use it, you have a lot of documents, a lot of things to show, and it is not easy to make a swap on a surface outside of an isolator, like on the floor, on the on, on, on the walls, because there you have to develop the method, what you what your recovery rate is. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you Richard. So 